Well, thank you so much, uh, Gloria and Sarah, for joining us here today. I'm thrilled to have a conversation with both of you. Um, amazing, amazing leaders, amazing female leaders in the indigenous world and in the world overall. Um, we are here today to talk about the, the power of indigenous storytelling and how this living form of storytelling um, is brought to, to new technologies like Unity. Um, I'm Jessica Lindell. I'm the head of social impact here at Unity and have the privilege of working with uh, creators and influencers like yourselves in shaping the world for the better. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Gloria to go ahead and introduce herself. Well, it's wonderful to be with you here this morning, Jessica and Sarah. Um, I'm really excited about the conversation. A little bit about myself is uh, I am Yupik and Sami and also Scots Irish. Uh, so like many of us, we have a lot of different cultures running through our veins. And I am also a lifelong Alaskan. And I've had the honor to serve as president and CEO of Cook Inlet Tribal Council, which is a tribal nonprofit social service provider that is located in Anchorage, Alaska, which is South Central Alaska. And so I'm really excited to be here today to share with you the story of CITC, the story of how storytelling and the culture of our people and the values of our people led us to developing this incredible game that we gave to the world back in 2014, Never Alone. And how we did that in our community through um, not only the spirit of our people, but, but thinking of new ways in which we could bring indigenous voice to the world utilizing and leveraging the power of media and technology. So I'm really excited to share that story with you and also the work of CITC. And the most important um, reason why we share this story is not only to continue to, to share the stories of our people with the world, but really for the advancement of our people within our communities. And Never Alone has allowed us to think in different ways, to use technology in different ways, and to be a part of this ever-changing world. So great to be here with you. Great, thank you so much, Gloria. I think we're gonna get to see Never Alone right now. So yeah. we'll go ahead and, and see the clip. Imanga kanga Kolek to a whole root, Kanak she love Louis, King Une King. Kolek to up the Kanak ship carova in the Russia, no, no. Sudi Kano in your neck put Iloni. Anglan, Sukhrawat, Utukat, Kuleak, Tuat, Al Rashutat, Tatkamna, a victor Tamna, she will never do, Mumina, the Raleo.
All right, thank you so much. Sarah, we'd love to hear more about you and your background. Um, good day, everybody. My Lakota name is Eagle Shaw Woman. I'm Ogallala Lakota from Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And I, you know, I call myself a social justice storyteller because I feel like I just want to do it all. <laughs> and so that's sort of my catch all so that I can do my work in the nonprofit space and support indigenous women through indigenous women led projects at Return of the Heart Foundation. But I'm also a producer and a writer and so everything under the storytelling umbrella and I I'm really loving the world that we're in right now and the fact that we can use virtual reality and use animation in ways that we've never seen before. Um, educate communities and you know, the world at the same time, really change systems that need to change so that we can move forward in our communities and, and just have more opportunities for Native Americans and indigenous peoples all over the world. Great overview, thank you. I think we're gonna see a quick snapshot of Crow the Legend. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about that before we see the video? Yeah, Crow the Legend is a virtual reality um, story that I did with John Legend, Get Lifted Studios and Baobop Studios back in 2009. We won a ton of animation awards. We ended up winning like four out of five Emmys. It was something that was just so, such a cred incredible experience. Um, so I got to play a voice on, on there. I played the moon. I said, who says no to playing the moon? So I'm Luna on there. <laughs> um, but I also got to help with the, with the storytelling on the cultural side as well. We love seeing that Emmy over your right hand shoulder there. <laughs> Excellent. All right, let's go ahead and see the clip of Crow the Legend. There was a time when it was always summer and life for the animals was peaceful and worry-free. Then one day, winter came to the forest for the very first time. Oh, I don't like this. Oh, oh, we gotta do something. Calm down. Someone must fly past the moon and the sun Crow. to where the stars dwell to the one who creates everything by thinking Hello? and convince him or her to make it warm for us once again oh i know he'll make any sacrifice to save us let's see what you're really made of Crow! Okay, excellent. Thanks so much. So let's dive into the conversation. Um, Gloria, we, we got to hear from you on how important it was for your community to be part of creating Never Alone. Um, we'd love to hear, hear a little bit more about how Never Alone has scaled change, not just within your community, but scaled impact globally as well. Yeah, I, I think that um, we, when, when, when we stood in the power of the spirit of our people and when we were thinking about how we could advance and bring more resources into our community and our board said, you know, we need to think about the core self-determination and part of that self-determination is uh, raising revenue that's unrestricted, right? Where we could actually make some investment for our people and all that we do at CITC. I mean, we basically support people throughout their entire lives from cradle to grave. So as we really started thinking about how we can make an investment, but keeping our people at the core, leveraging the um, not only um, our values, but leveraging our spirit of how we can take the voice of who we are into the world. And so we did not, when we started this process, we did not even think that we would help change uh, the world of video gaming, that we would create a whole new niche of video games, that that was so far from the sphere of what we were thinking. What we were thinking about is standing in the power of our people, standing in the culture of our people, and really saying we have to be true to ourselves. So as we did that, and as we looked at uh, taking up our voice in this industry and aligning with the right partners, um, 
the magic that happened was unbelievable to me because we said we wanted to do this right. We wanted to bring our people's authentic voice into the world. And so how do we do that is we created an inclusive development process where we made sure that we had elders, that we had youth, that we had storytellers from our community that represented the stories, the authentic stories and never alone and represented that voice. And because of that, because we stood in the power of our people, we were able to make huge impact in this growing industry of video games, number one. And we were able to show the world that it is possible that aligning with indigenous voice and having shared responsibility around creative decision-making that you could actually make a difference, that we could put our people forward, that they could be, they could be leading the conversations, they could be leading the creative decision making. And that's what was created from Never Alone. And so from that, it really opened up our eyes about number one, how do we as Native people, how do we stand in a leadership position as it relates to technology? What does that mean to our people? How do we continue to take what we've learned with Never Alone, working through line partners who have the value similar as we do, and making those investments where our people, it, it brings the power and the magic of our people to bear. So much you've touched on there. I mean, just the, the impact from a business model perspective of taking investments from your tribe and investing right. to be able to then have the revenue impact your community. Also the opportunity to, again, leverage the power of your people to bring that interdependence and that culture and that voice to the rest of the world. Exactly. And, and for me as, as a white American, I'm always struck by the individualism, individual approach of the society that I move around in, how different it is in your culture. So could you expand a little bit more on what you mentioned with the development process being really collaborative and you know, how you see that within your culture and how you brought it to a game development process? Yes, um, you're exactly right, is that when we make decisions, we really try to stay aligned with our values, and we do it in such a way where we take the perspective of the entire community um, into consideration. So it is from that collective platform that we were adamant when we negotiated the deal with our partners that we were gonna have a creative process where we made decisions side by side, where when we came into places of tension that we would go out to the community and ask the community about um, whatever that place of tension was or the question so the community could actually be a part of the creativity of the game. Now, it took a little bit longer Right, we had to really truly listen with not, not here just with our ears, but with our heart. We had to be very open, and we had to create, we had to create a sphere of trust with our partners to do this and with the community because that authenticity was so very important. The last thing that we wanted to do was put a game of our stories, which we carry the responsibility of how we bring our stories to the world as native people, that we, that we would put a game or an experience out there that wouldn't be authentic. And that wasn't gonna happen. For us, the authenticity, the community voice is what was much more important than the profit. Mm, absolutely. Sarah, I know you had really similar experiences. So if, if you could take it from there and then also tie in your advocacy work and sort of how that approach leads into your advocacy work too, we'd love to hear more. Yeah, so, um, you know, with my work that I've done my entire life, I've focused on social justice and I've done a lot of education on all kinds of issues. And that really stemmed from being a bridge builder, from being this sort of liaison between different worlds. So at one point, um, I was on the staff of the presiding bishop, Kath Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, the first presiding bishop, female presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. And so I was in between her and then the membership of the church, which was um, educating and advocating. And then at the same time, I was also a former CEO of Native Americans and Philanthropy that was the bridge builder between the philanthropic sector and Native American communities. So always in the middle. 
And I think when the moment happened where <laughs> our former president was elected was a moment where so much of the world was waking up, you know, Standing Rock was beginning to um, just erupt in ways and people were becoming more and more aware of the issues that affect Native Americans um, and indigenous peoples at large. There was a moment where the industry, Hollywood, was also recognizing the fact that they knew nothing about Native Americans <laughs> and, and they were also wanted to help and support, but really had no way, like didn't know how to do it. Um, that was the moment when I really just jumped into the middle and again, continued to be the educator and continued to be the, ad, the advocate, but an activist. I mean, I've also marched with Women's March um, and helped to organize a thousand women to go to Women's March um, back in 2017. So. Basically, I got to this point where I felt like the, the classroom by classroom, one-on-one -on -one education was just taking too long. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, this is not creating change. I'm not seeing a change in my home community or you know, the communities that are struggling with poverty or, or racism or whatever. And I thought, okay, we need to start educating at a bigger level. And I thought, okay, here are these Hollywood influencers who have these platforms of millions and millions of people. And if we could begin to influence what they were seeing and, and what they were doing and what they were learning, because as we know, the history in America for Native Americans is not accurate at all. I, the, it's mostly just been pro propaganda from, from to make everyone feel better about the fact that America was really colonized and that Native Americans experienced mass genocide. So for me, I saw virtual reality and animation and working within mainstream uh, audience appeal um, to be something that could happen really quickly and really fast. At the same time, it could be fun and healing for our own community. So Crow the Legend, when that opportunity came to me, it wasn't, I wasn't a, I mean, I'm, I'm not like Gloria or you, Jessica, that I worked in this industry forever. And I was really just a newbie that was a good advocate, right? And, and I, knew my, I knew my issues and I, I, I knew the stories that were important to tell. And Crow the Legend came along about a story um, about the Crow becoming black. And so many different tribes have this story, but it was also an opportunity to work with John Legend who has an amazing, incredible platform. And he wanted to make this story a cornerstone story of VR. And at the same time, we had Baobab Studios, which is an Asian owned um, studio managed by an Asian woman, Maureen Fawn. And they wanted to do it right. <laughs> they wanted to be allies. They wanted to bring in um, indigenous artists, um, indigenous um, actors, voice actors. And it became this partnership that I thought was just so beautiful because they were actually modeling what it means to work with a Native American community in authentic ways. Um, and so that's why I really loved it. And of course, I had no idea it was going to win an Emmy. I mean, who would have known that, <laughs> that it would win an Emmy? Mm -hmm. um, but it was such an incredible you know, moment to be a part of. And for me, it also demonstrated this ability to tell stories in new ways that with other influencers that I was working with. Um, so I've also been partnered with um, like Taboo from the Black Eyed Peas, who's, he's just Native American and just amazing anyway, that has been forever. But other artists like Portugal the Man that also like leverage their platforms and, and Love Alaska too, by the way. Um, and then, you know, like Mark Ruffalo and Anne Hathaway, like A-list stars that are willing to leverage their platforms to educate masses. And so for me, that's what was really um, just incredible about the work that I'm doing right now and the moment that we're in right now, because um, authentic storytelling from an Indigenous perspective, sharing Indigenous worldview is so critical to the future that I think we all need to have in this world to, to safeguard Mother Earth, as well as the thousands of Indigenous cultures that we have. Yeah, there's so there's so much opportunity, you know, in front of us and right now to be making change and making impact. And as the saying goes, you know, really shifting hearts and minds happens through storytelling. And so I'd love to hear from from each of you uh, around how you're thinking about the change that you want to make going forward and how you see immersive storytelling really being a platform to be able to make that change. 
I know, Gloria, if you want to start, you're actually um, an investor in the game development partner, right. Eli Media. Yeah. You're an investor in the right. entire company, not just the right. game. And so I'd love to hear how, about how you're thinking about the future and working with them. And then Sarah, if you can pick up from there after that and just, you know, all the incredible advocacy work that you're looking at too, and your book and everything else. All right, go ahead. Uh, so, so in my uh, opening comments, as I talked about making the investment never alone, what we realized quickly um, as the game was being uh, let to the world is that uh, we worked with Eli Media, which is an incredible partner with Align Values of, uh, like CITC. And um, so what we decided to do was not knowing really anything about the industry and really thinking about creating an unrestricted uh, revenue stream back to CITC and back to our communities to support our programs for the advancement of our people and self-determination. What we thought is the best thing we could do is lean in right now and uh, take 30% of the company. And so we did a deal with Eline uh, back in 2014. And through that, um, I happened to be, as a result of the negotiation of the deal, happened to become chair of the Eline board. And so it's really been incredible because our everyday 24 seven job is about serving people. So really having you know, our feet in the world of serving our community and at the same time learning about this whole new industry that we really had no background in, right? But um, again, I think that because of that connection and because of the, um, the partnership with Eline Media, it's really led us to think differently uh, about technology and to think differently about how we can make impact, not only in our community, but in the entire world. So as a result of uh, Never Alone, we've actually, I believe, uh, have uh, had 4 million downloads. Um, of course, Never Alone is in several different languages, uh, many different platforms, and we've had hundreds of thousands of impressions. So just that alone is incredible, the social impact of it. And I do believe, as I said prior, that what we learned is technology can have such an incredible um, ability to change the hearts and minds of people, some of these immersive experiences. And not only that, is really thinking about, as, as Sarah mentioned, what about the models of education? Because education is quickly changing in our world. And it's changing because of the way that we engage and use technology every day in every aspect of our world. So as our big systems change, like the education system, what we want to do within our community is take this learning uh, through the making of Never Alone through the uh, learning about how to be executives in the video gaming industry and really apply that unique partnership back to our community. So we've brought in a partnership with uh, MIT, the Fab Lab. We've created these Fab Labs for our young people and it's been incredible where our kids who sometimes do not do well in the traditional education system really Really see themselves using uh, their imaginations, using their hands, actually solving problems in their own community through technology. Um, and how can we take more of that into the world? How can we share that through the broader indigenous community? So we've been able to really step more into a place and give ourselves the permission to do so. I think as Native people, um, it, we, we sometimes have to really be pushed into a place of leadership or see the way through. And the, what, what I'm say, talking about there is that's, that's that futuristic storytelling, that we start seeing the pathway through and how technology can help us, not only in the media industries we discuss, but also in education and how we can be a part of creating these new radical models of learning where we take who we are, the magic of who we are, our cultures, our stories, our values, 
and put it through the multi-dimensional lens that we bring to the world. To me, that is such a gift. So, and that's what I love about technology. I get really excited about this because technology is multi-dimensional. So as we started to think about the future through world build, so starting to create the seeds of our story moving forward, knowing where we've been, knowing where we are currently and how we're moving forward. One of our tribal leaders and board members recently said, um, to us is that our ancientness is futurism. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that and I thought it just took all this, <gasps> you know, we don't have to be anyone else than who we are as native people through our culture, through our language, through the multi-dimensional way in which we look at the world. This is how technology is changing all of our systems and all we have to do is connect and give ourselves permission to step into that place of leadership. And I think as Sarah was talking about and all her incredible work, I think that we're moving in that direction. And to me, that's really exciting. It just gives me goosebumps. Thank you, agreed. You got I think... all revved up on that question. <laughs> <laughs> It is truly the, yeah, yeah, the sustainable path forward. Um, so Sarah, tell us, tell us how you're thinking about next steps and the impact you're going to be making. Yeah, I mean, so number one, I just want to say like the reason why I love VR and I've come to love VR so much is because um, I've been working on healing, you know, my entire life as well. So I've been working to educate people about this history, about where we are, you know, about indigenous people, like bringing us into contemporary settings. And, and so being here at, at South by Southwest is huge for us because, you know, we don't often get that opportunity. Um, but in the virtual reality world, I also just loved in Crow the Legend, you're surrounded by all of these animals. And I just thought that you're dancing with them and you're singing with them. And I just thought that was such a healing moment for me, like as an adult, because I was like, oh my gosh, like I've been taught that I'm related to the two-legged, the four-legged, the winged, like my entire life. And I am interacting with them, like in a way, like they're my brothers and sisters and I'm dancing with them. And I just thought, oh my gosh, like the, the idea that fun can also heal you. And so I, I love that you actually get to have that um, very um, intimate like experience through technology with, you know, the, the larger world, depending upon the world that you build. Like, I, I love that. And I think moving forward, you know, that type of world, world, world building <laughs> is exciting because um, there's so much to share. When we talk about indigenous worldview, a lot of people don't understand what that means and they really want to, but it's really about thinking holistically, thinking collectively. And that's something that we're taught from the time that we're children. So being able to share that perspective with the world is something that's actually really going to save it. I mean, it's, it's not even just joking around. And I think in the, as I continue my work with healing, I mean, I am also looking at alternative ways of how do I do that through my storytelling, through my producing. Um, so yes, I'm writing a book with my identical twin sister, um, Emma. Um, Eagle Heart White, and she's a psychotherapist who has worked uh, with domestic violence and um, survivors and youth like her entire career. And we both one day were, I came to her and I was like, I think I'm supposed to write a book. And I thought I was like really special. And she was like, me too. And I was like, well, what's your book about? And she's like, healing. I said, me too. I was like, I think we're supposed to do this together. And, um, and so that started us down a path where um, our book is going to be published. It's a self-help memoir where we talk about our life and just our experiences and everything, like the good and the bad. But it's an effort to educate about Indigenous worldview, but also talk about healing and how that worldview, I mean, our people have survived for so long because we have cultural protective factors that are built into our communities that are not often shared from like an asset perspective. And so we want to share that with the larger community and world. And then at the same time, you know, I also see my part of, you know, winning the Emmy, which was so amazing. And I got to share that with my grandma on the reservation um, two years ago. 
I see myself as being in a place where I have a network where I can help, you know, other indigenous women build their networks and also help them to tell their stories. Because I do believe like the, the women that are in the grassroots communities, you know, obviously with COVID, they were doing the response, like they were taking care of their family, they were getting the PPE, but they were also getting out the vote <laughs> and, they were, and, and for me, it was like, okay, these women are doing it all and all they need is to help, you know, build a network and a pathway. So that's what we do at Return to the Heart. And we also want to fund them and their brilliant ideas because we know that they're not just thinking about themselves and they're not just helping themselves. They're gonna help their community. They're gonna help multiple tribal communities and the world because that's just the way that they're built. Um, so for me, focusing on those women and focusing on how we can help them is something that we're absolutely exploring. And we are talking about how do we do our education um, better? How do we do it with animation and VR? Ex exactly like what Gloria was saying, because I think that's the direction that we have to go. Um, I, I was just on a phone call with um, somebody and it's just like side, side story. But they were talking about how they were building a program to bring indigenous peoples into a campus where they could talk, a virtual campus, where they could talk about, you know, all this stuff campus related. And I said to myself, well, what about vice versa? <laughs> you know, like, like that, like being in the community is so important to understanding that worldview. And I, I look at technology as just being an incredible way um, to be the teacher and to be the connector uh, as well. Thank you so much. You both you both have hit on something that is critical right now in the era of COVID that we're we're living in. I think I I just read in December that the U.S. lost 140,000 jobs, and unbelievably, 100% of those were women leaving the workforce. Impacted primarily Black, Latinx, and Indigenous women. And you've touched on how in both of your communities you're really focusing on education to increase not just economic opportunity, but the potential and power of these future storytellers in making not just your community again, but the whole world a much more sustainable place. So I would love to hear what you want from us, us being companies like Unity, other tech companies, and how we can support you in those efforts. Who wants to go first? Sarah, Sarah are you, yeah, you Sarah, we'll start with you. <laughs> I know Gloria has a really succinct answer here, um, you know, and amazing answer. Um, so for me, I think like one of the one of the things that I think about is, you know, I'm from Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and I remember about 20, 30 years ago, um, you know, we talk about like why are there not companies on reservations, and why isn't there more investment on reservations and I remember hearing about a study where some big manufacturing companies came in, they did a whole study about the reservations, and then they said, you know what, like, it's just not sustainable, we can't do it. And so somebody in the 70s or, you know, decided, blanketly decided, like, don't invest there, like, don't do it. Um, so, which is ridiculous, I think it's ridiculous. And I, I also think that it's time to really switch up, you know, those, um, those types of ideas and that native people we're I mean we're artists many of our communities we have so much artists that are there that are you know that have been cultivating their art at the same time we have a lot of young people that are excited about technology and they and they want to build these bigger worlds and they want they're going out there and they're they're actually what's amazing right now is that the cultural lens that we're living in right now are young people. I mean, I have a 25 year old and a 21 year old and they love technology and they love the arts. And I love that they know exactly who they are. Like they're not trying to fit into some other box. And so I really think it's time for companies to take the leap, actually take the investment that is going to take, which is a lot of education, which is probably good to undo your Western individualistic <laughs> mindset mm -hmm. and begin to take that investment of for your own person individually and your companies to be able to um, build these, these companies and that can really help 
undo all of these systems of oppression that we've actually been living in for so long. And I think that it can also change some of the racist dynamics that we have in so many communities as well, because we know when there's not investment in a community, there's not going to be opportunities for those people in that community, but technology changes all of that. And if we could just find a way to partner right there, that would be the opening you know, opportunity for so many Native Americans who are living in rural America that they need that opportunity. And I think you know, technology is one of the simplest ways to make that happen. Beautiful. That was very well done as a saint and powerful, Sarah. <laughs> um, I, I agree with Sarah. I think technology is the greatest equalizer as it relates to not only creating opportunities, but allowing our kids to be on pace with, with the, the, the traditional mainstream um, system. And so that's why I think it's so, it's a, such a powerful tool. But for companies, um, and Sarah is correct, it takes a different mindset. It takes more time. It takes a lot more time. It takes building relationship, it takes listening, and most of all, it takes intention. And I think setting the intention for the larger companies to say that we want to make a significant investment in partnering with indigenous communities um, and thinking not only about the investment and the end result, but how do you grow people along the way? How, how do you ensure that there are um, the, the opportunities where you can leverage that creativity, where you can leverage the multi-dimensional thinking and, and the holistic way of looking at the world? Because I agree that that is what we need for the sustainability of our globe moving forward. So uh, what we learned again, working with Never Alone in the creative process is that we had to create a sphere of trust. We had to create a sphere of aligned values and being very, uh, being, being very transparent in our relationships. And I, I believe that companies can do that. I believe that companies can do that if they set the intention to do it. And a lot of times companies say, well, we're, we're in this uh, time where it's all about inclusion and you know, ensuring you have minorities. And honestly, it's really about checking the box. And we, we don't wanna participate in that anymore. We've had too much of that in our history. Uh, we've had so much um, oppression with paternalism because of the relationships that we do currently have, uh, I could say in particular with the federal government. And so, you know, working with companies gives us another avenue of not only investment, but co-creation, co-investment. And I think that allows for a lot more creativity than a system, whether it's a business or a government coming in, making an investment, but already having a predetermined lens of what that's going to look like, where you don't truly involve the community members, that you don't involve not only the creativity, but, but the multi-generational aspect of, of what gives it its magic, right? So mm -hmm. I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity moving forward, but I do think companies need to be very intentional. And when companies can figure this out, there's so much magic. And there's it is not just potentially a financial return, but it's a triple bottom line return. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that's why we did what we did with Never Alone is we realized we could not wait for the federal government to give us the kind of resources that we knew we needed to respond to our community needs, because then they give us resources. It's in a box. Right. Mm -hmm. That we had to do this through another tool in our toolbox. And that was through investment. Mm -hmm. And we had to take the risks. We had to we had to kind of go to that purpose, that that place of great change, and be vulnerable and step into it. Um, but thank goodness that we did our research and we had the right 
partners. And I do want to give Unity a plug because Unity was a huge partner when developing Never Alone. And it's been a great relationship and continues to be one with Eline with Beyond Blue um, and, and uh, other um, initiatives that we have within the company. So we appreciate we appreciate Unity and asking the question, you know, and saying, what, what does it take? I love the answer, because I think what you both have really hit on is um, the question itself is incorrect, which is not what we can, what can we do to support you? The question is, how do we build an authentic relationship where all of us are benefiting? And I remember sitting with Alan about five years ago when he had just taken your investment and was yeah. working together. And his view on Eline was that the culture was so much better as a result of the relationship that yeah. your contribution really shifted his company culture. And I think there's some saying that culture eats strategy for lunch and we <laughs> see it day in and day out in Silicon Valley and tech. Um, and so just the power of your indigenous practices really influencing our cultures to make them more enduring and sustainable mm -hmm. is an incredible, incredible idea. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, Sarah, what you said. It was something like you you have these like I don't I interpret it as like cultural superpowers that allow you to have sustainability. <laughs> and I was like, I want to know what those are. <laughs> um, so if you do have them top of mind, let us know. Um, if you don't, would love to just hear your closing thoughts and then uh, we'll move to Gloria for her closing thoughts too. Uh, I don't know about I don't know about cultural superpowers, but I mean I will say I will say it's the values, right? So I'm going to go back to values. And I actually do have them handy because I, I just keep them handy anyway. Um, but Lakota values are really centering around like praying, respect, caring and compassion, honesty and truth, generosity and helping, humility and wisdom. And so in everything that you know, I do as a Lakota person, I am taught to always go back to these values that are really not about centering yourself, but about centering your community and helping other people. And so for me to, to do all the good things I want to do in the world, like that means I have to help my people. And that's just something that's ingrained in my head. I don't know where it came from, <laughs> like from my, the time, you know, I was little was like, if I, I just needed to do good and I just needed to help my people. And I feel that, you know, for Lakota people, we have a saying called Medakuya Oyase, which is actually, it's our amen. And we say it at the end of our prayers and it means we're all connected, we're all related. And so all, when I say our people, it's everybody. Um, it's the two-legged, the four-legged, the winged, it's everybody, mother earth, thank you. Aww. Thank you. That is so beautiful. Um, I knew I'd learn a lot by being a part of this conversation and getting to meet you, Sarah. I too think it's all based in values. Uh, CITC values are a combination of values that represent the broader Alaska Native community and respect, resilience, and we need a lot of resilience and we de have demonstrated a lot of resilience, interdependence, that we're all connected and that we are accountable for our community. And most recently, our tribal leaders have added the, the value, which I absolutely love, of humor, right? Because mm. we all need more humor and as Native people, we have very, uh, Cha you know, very, uh, I guess, uh, sometimes challenging uh, lives and families. But once we bring that humor into it, it, it just, it, it just aligns everything, right? It, it makes, it makes for uh, more authenticity and actually the realness of people. It's like one of our tribal leaders says to, it's, it's like taking time to be human. You know, so can you just you can you just feel that in the in the world if we all just took time to be human and that we just took a moment, maybe we had some humor and connectivity. But I think that all of this does connect into the the idea of spiritual wellness that's based upon um, the way that we describe it, it's based upon the relationships. And as Sarah said, this interconnectivity is so important and with you know, when the world realizes 
that we're not alone. We're never alone. That's why we named it Never Alone, because we are all connected. Uh, we're connected to each other. We're connected to our planet. We're, we're, we're just connected as beings is that when we realize that we're not alone, I think it's going to be a much better place, right? And so it's within that spirit that, um, you know, we do our work that really inspires me around this journey of not only uh, my healing, but the healing of our people. And how do we bring powerful tools and step into a leadership role around technology? How do we bring those tools so that our people can really engage with the, the, with, with, with the current world and bring themselves to the current world, right? And so um, I really look forward to where we're headed in the future, how we continue, we'll be guided by our values that will uh, align with incredible partners along the way to get us to where we need to go next. And that we as native people, just know this, as native people, we're resilient. We, like we always say in Alaska, we've been here for 10,000 years. We're gonna be here for another 10,000 years. No joke. And that we are creating our story for the future together. And so we really hope that we can collectively stand in that partnership, that we can be inclusive of others as we create that story of change. Oh, so powerful. Well, thank you both so much for this hour of, of being human, just being human <laughs> together. Don't you love that? I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, and I also, I would love to close, Sarah, let me know if I butcher this with uh, Madaka, Madaka Oyase. How do I say it again? Madaka Oyase. Madaka Oyase. All right. I'm going to need to practice that 10 times. <laughs> okay. Thanks again to both of you. Bye-bye. Thank you.